Hello and welcome everybody. Um, we're just going to give it a few minutes for, to allow people to join. We'll be back in a few minutes. That. Hello and welcome to the public lecture in nutrition and exercise for weight management, fact and fiction. We're just going to give it another two minutes to allow people to join and then we'll get ready to start. Hello and welcome to the public lecture on nutrition and exercise for weight management, fact and fiction. We're just going to give it another minute or two to wait for people to join and then we'll get started. No, okay, good evening everybody. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to our public lecture on nutrition and exercise for weight management, fact and fiction. Tonight I'm absolutely delighted to introduce my two colleagues, Associate Professor Claire Corish and Dr. Katie Horner from the Institute of Food and Health in UCD. So Claire is a registered dietitian and Associate Professor in Clinical Nutrition and Dietetics at UCD. During her career, she has worked in dietetic practice, research and education, and in UCD, she manages a professional graduate program in clinical nutrition and dietetics. Claire's research activities are focused predominantly on malnutrition in older people, nutrition in early childhood, and nutrition and lifestyle among shift workers. She served on many expert committees during her career. 
Katie completed her PhD studies in sport and exercise science in the University of Limerick. She completed her PhD in the area of exercise and appetite control in Australia. She subsequently worked in weight management clinic in the Centre of Children's Hospital at Pittsburgh in the US. Subsequently, she returned to Ireland and she's currently a lecturer in sport and exercise science here in UCD. Tonight, Claire and Katie will deliver the lecture together, starting firstly with Claire and then switching over to Katie. And then they'll both come back and sum up the key recommendations um, of, of their talk. The lecture will last approximately 30 minutes and we'll leave about 15 minutes for questions at the end. You can post your questions in the Q&A box. However, I ask that you wait until the end of the lecture before posting the questions. With that, I hope that you enjoy the lecture and I hand over to Claire, who's going to start off. Okay, thank you very much, Lorraine, for the introductions. So the purpose of the talk this evening is to focus on facts and fictions that surround weight management, and we hope provide you with some useful and practical information. We're going to look at, firstly, scientific evidence and how it's derived. Then we're going to look at some common nutrition and exercise myths and the facts and fictions around those. And then go on to provide some practical advice for weight management. So this slide really demonstrates the difficulties associated with energy balance. Energy balance is often portrayed as easy. Calories consumed versus calories expended. However, as you can see on this slide, the, the, the energy balance is actually very difficult. It's very complex. Maintenance of body weight is regulated by homeostatic factors. So, for example, different hormones, different neuropeptides that can induce or suppress hunger. And these are often determined by food intake, by body weight itself, or by energy balance. We also have environmental factors that come into play our obesogenic environment and behavioral factors, for example, how we react to stress. And even in the current circumstances, some people react very differently than others. How all of these are, how all of these are influenced then by our genes and by the fact that unfortunately, physiological adaptation to weight loss favors weight regain. So it is far from simple. A Google search for weight loss gave 1,940 billion hits in less than one second. However, unfortunately, despite the number of hits, this does not provide the scientific evidence on which to promote weight loss. When we look at scientific studies, they're based on their scientific rigor. And you can see here the scientific pyramid that we use. At the top of the pyramid are systematic reviews and meta-analysis of what we call randomized control trials. These take years to complete. And randomized control trials, or RCTs, as you may have heard, are studies that investigate the effectiveness of a treatment. So in this case, a specific diet. And these are very difficult to do for dietary interventions, as it is not possible for participants to know if they are to, to not know whether they are following a specific diet or not. It's very different than a medical intervention where people can be given a tablet or a placebo tablet, which is much easier to control for. Observational studies are lower down in the hierarchy. And these studies are those that have lower quality evidence, but they still can provide some evidence. Uh, they observe the effect of a risk factor on health outcomes, but no treatment is given. What is very clear, though, is that scientific evidence is not anecdote or what works for one person, no matter how well that person perceives it to work for them or how, how much they promote it. Or what family, as we say, friends and um, other people advise, regardless of how well-meaning the, that advice is intended. So we're going to look at three uh, common uh, facts. Dr. Horner and I are going to look at uh, three diet and exercise topics and discuss each to establish which is fact and which, what is fact and what is fiction. So the first that I will look at is intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting or uh, intermittent energy restricted diets have become very popular as a weight management strategy. Energy is severely restricted for short periods, typically between one and four days per week. 
And the rationale for such diets is very good. It makes perfect sense. The food we eat, as we know, is broken down by enzymes in, our, enzymes in our gut and ends up in our bloodstream. And carbohydrates, particularly refined carbohydrates and sugars, are rapidly broken down into glucose, which our cells then use for energy. If our cells don't use the energy, we store the glucose as fat. And glucose needs insulin to bring the glucose from our bloodstream into the cells and keep it there. If we don't snack between meals, or if we go for periods of time without eating, our insulin levels fall and our fat cells release their glucose. And the idea is with intermittent fasting is that our insulin levels drop for long enough for us to burn our fat. However, when we look at the studies actually shown, uh, that what the studies actually demonstrate, most of the weight loss seen with intermittent fasting is due to a reduction in energy intake. So I suppose when we look at it carefully, we see that intermittent fasting makes weight loss easy, and that's not actually true. The best way to intermittently fast is still not clear. As I showed you on the previous slide, there are five different ways, and there's, there's more as well. There was a very nice, well, when we look at the scientific evidence, um, that shows very nicely that intermittent fasting Fasting shows promise, but little is known about its long-term sustainability and health effects. So regardless of what cel celebrities or others promote, this is what the scientific evidence shows. And this was in a very nice, high-quality, systematic review uh, published in a Canadian Family Physician Journal in 2020. The next uh, slide, that I, the next um, diet that I want to look at are low-carbohydrate diets. And again, the rationale for these is something similar to the intermittent fasting. So the, what is proposed is that low carbohydrate diets let you eat until you're full and still lose weight. And that you need a low carbohydrate diet to burn fat. But when we look at the scientific evidence, the scientific evidence states that low and very low carbohydrate diets, including ketogenic diets, are not superior to other weight loss diets and also may severely restrict nutrient-dense foods that offer advantages for cardiovascular um, disease. We do know that low uh, and very low carbohydrate diets and ketogenic diets may reduce appetite or may suppress appetite. And it, it, they may also be beneficial in reducing the levels of some blood fats, so for example, triglycerides. But we also know that they are not beneficial in reducing other blood fats. So for example, your low density lipoprotein cholesterol or the bad cholesterol. However, what is also recognized is that some people may prefer a low carbohydrate eating pattern. And what is agreed and what there's consensus on is that this is reasonable for short periods up to six months. However, what is also known and what is shown by the scientific literature is that compliance is difficult beyond this time and that the long-term risks are poorly understood. So that the risks and benefits of a low-carbohydrate diet should be discussed with a medical practitioner or dietitian as every person is individual. We do know that carbohydrate is important. It is the main source of fuel for our brain. And we also should be aware that when uh, carbohydrate is promoted in diets, the recommendations are that we should take those carbohydrates from whole grain or unrefined carbohydrate sources, which are also rich in vitamins and minerals. This um, slide very nicely shows that different diets may be preferred by different people. And this was shown in a paper that's only recently been published, the 1st of April in 2020 in which 14 diets were examined, and the key finding being that most diets result in weight loss and improved blood pressure at six months, but that this is no longer the case at 12 months. We will put this presentation, and you can refer back to the infographic which was pre presented in the paper, and we will put the presentation up after this uh, uh, on the Institute of Food and, and Health website. Another popular diet at the moment is a plant-based diet. And it is well recognized that a plant-based diet is a healthy weight loss diet. And it's sometimes promoted that the more plant-based you get, the more weight loss. So therefore that a vegan diet is better than a vegetarian diet, which is better than an animal-based diet. 
However, a paper that was published last September in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition makes very common sense or states very commonsensically that a healthful diet, which is a healthful plant-based diet, is associated with less weight gain over four years, whereas an unhealthy plant-based diet is associated with higher weight gain. And this is very nicely shown in the graph or the figure from this paper, which shows very clearly that people are inclined to gain weight over a four year period. You can see there in the dotted line that when people follow a plant based healthy diet, they lose weight. But when people follow an unhealthy plant based diet, they actually gain weight also. So the key point being that it is important to maintain or adhere to a healthy diet. Katie's now going to take over and go through three um, facts and fictions um, around exercise. Okay, Katie. Thanks very much, Claire. So with exercise for weight loss, um, sorry, Claire. Sorry. <laughs> so with exercise for weight loss, it's also very similar to nutrition. And we get very mixed messages when we look at media and gym advertisements. On the one hand, we have media articles like this one here from Time magazine with the title, Why Exercise Won't Make You Thin, conveying this message that it's impossible to lose weight with exercise. But on the other hand, you might see images like this guy here, maybe advertising exercise programs are similar and implying that if you exercise, you can look like this. And basically that it, with the message, if you stick to it, everyone can lose weight. And it's no wonder that it's confusing when we look at the headlines. I have an example of another media headline here at the top from September of last year. So the headline is diet or exercise to lose weight, but don't do both, says study. And when you go and actually look at the study that that media article is referring to, this is the title here. So exercise degrades bone and caloric restriction despite suppression of marrow adipose tissue. And this was a study that was conducted in female mice. So how on earth that uh, media headline can be derived from that article is quite difficult to comprehend. And it really highlights how important it is that we go beyond the headlines and look to see what the research actually says. So what does the research actually say? Well, this is a review of high quality evidence. So it's primarily looking at randomized controlled trials as Claire mentioned, and it looked at average weight losses with different modes of exercise. So the first one was looking at pedometer based programs. So this might be something like a, aiming for 10,000 steps per day. And average weight loss in these type of programs was zero to one kilos. With aerobic exercise based programs, so this is exercise on a treadmill or bike, average weight loss being zero to two kilos. With resistance exercise, on average, no weight loss expected. With combined modes, so an aerobic plus resistance, zero to two kilos expected on average. But where the real meaningful weight loss came was when you combined diet with exercise. And in this review paper, on average, it was between nine and 13 kilos. So really highlighting that weight loss with exercise itself is quite minimal. And to achieve meaningful weight loss, you really need to add diet to exercise. But there we were talking about averages. So it's important to think how many of us are actually the average. And we can think about this, or the average person, we can think about this in all aspects. We're all individuals. And I've pulled out this figure here because I think it highlights this point very nicely. This was a study conducted by researchers at the University of Leeds who've done a lot of work in this area. And they enrolled people in, in a 12 week aerobic exercise program. And people were asked to expend 500 calories in energy five days per week for 12 weeks. They enrolled 59 people in total. And this figure here shows what, happens to, what happened to those 59 people's weight at the end of that 12 week program. So each person is represented by a black bar. So there's 59 bars there. And if you look to the left, you can see that one person lost just over 14 kilos. You've other people losing maybe seven or eight kilos and others not losing very much weight at all. And some even gaining a small bit of weight. 
The average weight loss was just under four kilos, and this was also what was predicted based on the amount of energy expenditure. But you can see a huge amount of variability around that. So if we go back to the facts and the fiction, the message that it's impossible to lose weight with exercise, no, that's not true. The message that if you stick to it, everyone will lose weight, that's also not true. But what is true is that weight loss with exercise is variable. So what explains this variability? Why do some people lose more weight with exercise than others? The first thing people often think of is adherence, that someone just didn't do the exercise. But in this study, this, in the study we just looked at, this was highly controlled. It was conducted in a lab and all the exercise was supervised. So we know that everyone did the same amount of exercise in the lab. Instead, what, what the variability seems to be explained by is changes in other components of energy balance. So if we're on an exercise bike or going for a run, for example, that might be for one hour in the day. But there's another 23 hours in the day and what we do during that time also matters. So what other activity we do during the day and what food we eat during the day, all of that will determine whether we're in an energy deficit at the end of the day. But while it looks simple, it's not. When we increase our physical activity or reduce our food intake, there are a whole host of changes that can occur within our bodies. And these are different between people. And I'm not going to explain this slide in detail. It's really just to highlight the complexity here, that if we just look at some of the factors that can influence food intake, we have a whole range of biological factors, psychological factors, and the environment, as Clara mentioned earlier. And these can all impact on food intake. Many can respond differently to exercise and also vary between people. So we're all individuals and can all respond differently. And if we even think about right now, we've all been predominantly indoors for a long time. And all of these factors will likely have been quite different to what they were two months ago. So, so far we've looked at exercise for weight loss, but what about weight maintenance or preventing weight regain after weight loss? This can, while many people can lose weight, keeping that weight off can actually be one of the biggest challenges for most people. So this is an early study showing what appears to be a crucial role for exercise in maintaining weight loss. This was a study of Boston policemen in the 1980s, and they were randomized to either weight loss over eight weeks by diet alone, shown as the dashed line, or diet plus exercise, shown as the solid black line. So you can see that over the treatment period there, over that eight weeks, both groups lost significant amounts of weight and there weren't too much, wasn't too much difference between the two groups. But where the big role for exercise seemed to be was in that weight maintenance period. So at the end of the eight weeks, they were reassigned to either diet alone or diet plus exercise. And you can see there that the diet group regained the weight. So at 80 weeks, so about a year and a half later, they'd regained nearly all of that weight that they'd lost. But the diet plus exercise group, they lost the weight and they kept it off, uh, it off up to a year and a half later. And this finding that exercise appears to have a crucial role in preventing weight regain and in weight maintenance has since been shown in various other contexts, including a recent systematic review published earlier this year, so in 2020, showing increased physical activity was one of the major factors associated with weight loss maintenance and preventing weight regain in people that had lost weight. Sorry, Claire. Yeah, I have, I've moved it. Oh, sorry, so don't yeah. move down. Yeah. yeah, no, that's perfect. Okay, sorry, okay. But, so one okay. explanation for this is that energy balance appears easier to maintain at a higher level of physical activity. And this is one of the first illustrations of this from a study in India in the 1950s. On the horizontal axis, people were classified into different categories of physical activity based on their jobs. So you've, going from sedentary workers, these were office clerks, right the way up to those involved in medium, heavy work and ve very heavy work, so blacksmiths and manual laborers. And if you look to the right, you can see that with an increase in activity, 
there's an increase in calorie intake. So it's calorie intake shown on the vertical axis. So with an increase in activity that was associated with an increase in intake. But if you look at the, to the left, to the other side, unfortunately, it doesn't work the other way around. Being sedentary wasn't associated with a reduction in food intake. It was actually associated with an increase back up again in calorie intake. So what this means is that sitting more was associated with eating more. And that's something that maybe some of us might be able to relate to at the or recently during lockdown. So what this really highlights is that it's much more difficult to maintain energy balance when we're sedentary. So in summary, re regular exercise, as we've just looked at, appears to have a crucial role in preventing weight gain and in, main in weight maintenance when it's adhered to. So regular exercise will help in keeping weight off. In terms of weight loss with exercise, it's often minimal, but it's also variable. So this will depend on changes in other components of energy balance. It's important that we have realistic expectations with regards to weight loss with exercise. And as we looked at earlier, it's also essential that we acknowledge the important role that diet has. So diet combined with exercise being important for weight loss. So I'm going to hand back to Claire now, who's going to go through some practical nutrition recommendations. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so really, I suppose what we need to look at first is whether we need to lose weight. And the best way of calculating that is to use body mass index. And a normal body mass index is between 18.5 and 24.9 kg per meter squared. We've included a, a, body mass, a body mass index calculator here. So when you go back and look on the Institute of Food and, we and Health website, you'll be able to calculate out your BMI. And it's important then that you classify yourself correctly within the category. So underweight, normal, overweight, obese, or clinically obese. And even though BMI can be criticized at times, for the general population, it still has the best, it still reflects our total body mass to the best extent. Obviously, it's if, if somebody's a, a trained athlete, uh, that isn't always correct, but for the general population, it is. The other thing that is important to use and to be aware of is waist circumference. You, you, I'm sure you've all heard of people who are apple shaped versus pear shaped. So apple shaped really means that we have weight around our waist, okay? And pear shaped really means that we have waist, weight around our bottoms. And unfortunately being apple shaped, it puts us at higher risk of cardiovascular and metabolic diseases. So it's important for a man to have a, BM, to have a waist circumference of less than 94 centimeters, if at all possible, and for a woman to have a waist circumference of less than 80 centimeters. And even if we, um, you know, if, if BMI doesn't go down as quickly as we would like, if we can lose weight from our waist, that will be cardiovascularly protective. So how can I lose weight safely? Well, the most important thing is to make small changes gradually, uh, because uh, that has been shown throughout the literature or in all publications that it, people who lose weight gradually he, are more likely to keep it off. We need to aim to lose about five to 10% of current body weight, regardless of how overweight somebody is. If they can lose five to 10% of their body weight, that will really help improve their cardiovascular uh, and metabolic uh, uh, measures. Aim to lose about one pound or about 0.5 of a kg per week. And it's achieved by eating fewer calories than would normally be eaten each day and, and being more active, as, as Katie said. So how do we do this? What are the best ways of doing this? And the first way is actually eating more, but more of fruit and veg. So we try and increase our fruit and veg per day to at least five per day, but even more if at all possible. And a very nice study that was published out of Imperial College in London was called the 10 a day study. And what that showed was the 10 portions of fruit and vegetables, so about 800 grams of fruit and vegetables per day, reduced the risk of heart disease, risk of stroke, cancer, and, the, and uh, dying prematurely by quite significant amounts. So really that's what our first key focus must be to try and eat a variety of foods. So can you eat a rainbow? Yes, you can, and you should, and try and do it every day. If somebody can't eat their greens, some people just won't eat or don't like green vegetables. I suppose the thing is to try and do is to try and think of other ways around that. 
So try and add fruit to cereals and porridge. Remember you're not alone. Try to have vegetable soup sauces. Uh, try and have smoothies. There are lots of different ways to try and have fruit and vegetables. And even if you eat the same two fruits or the same two vegetables every single day, but they're the ones that you like, so be, you know, it's still, a, a, it's still a good improvement to your diet. The other thing that we have to be careful of is portion sizes. And particularly for the meat and poultry foods, the protein foods. So really a, a portion size should reflect half the size of the palm of your hand. So if you're a bigger person, you have a bigger palm and you get a bigger portion. And if you're a smaller person, you have a smaller palm and you get a smaller portion. When we look at carbohydrate foods, all right, they are sometimes regarded badly, but as I said already, they're required as the, the source of fuel for the brain. But what we're promoting is whole grain carbohydrate foods, whole grain pastas, whole grain uh, breads, potatoes, porridge muesli, the whole grain varieties. What people must be very careful of, what all of us must be careful of if we're trying to maintain or lose weight is the foods containing fats. Because for every gram of food containing fat, so your fat sources contain about nine kilocalories per gram, whereas protein and carbohydrate contains approximately four kilocalories per gram. So we need to be careful of the amounts of fat we add to our foods, regardless of whether these fats are from the sources of fat that are more conducive to, car to good cardiovascular health. The other thing that is really important is to try, and it ties in very well with fruit and vegetables, increasing fruit and vegetables, is to increase dietary fibre. And really what is re recommended is to have 25 to 30 grams of dietary fibre per day. And this has been shown to improve um, uh, cardiovascular health, bowel health, and even improve uh, or, or reduce the risk of developing some cancers. And this was very nicely shown from the POUND study. So the POUND study is a large study in the US preventing overweight using novel dietary strategies. And this was published in last October, October 2019, and really reinforces the findings from the plant-based studies in which the weight loss is mainly attributed to higher fiber and its ability to make people eat more slowly and to the width that need to be chewed for, because the fiber to containing foods need to be chewed more and to make people feel fuller because they have greater satiety. There's practical ways here to increase your fiber intake. I'm not going to go through them all now, but you can refer to those when you later on. And um, the other thing that really you must be careful of is alcohol, all right? And again, in this time of lockdown, you know, I think everybody's saying that everybody's drinking more than they normally are, should or should drink, and I think that applies to all of us, but we really have to be careful, not only of the amount of alcohol and the effects that alcohol has, has on our health, but also the caloric value of alcohol. Because you can see very nicely here, that say, for example, a pint of beer has about 170 calories, uh, the same as a donut, a glass of wine, it's a good sized glass of wine now, has about the same as a Cornetto, a bar of chocolate and a gin and tonic about the same, and a package of crisps and a glass of Prosecco or champagne. But the thing is, we probably wouldn't eat three donuts in a row or three Cornettos in a row or three packets of crisps in a row. We could easily drink three Proseccos or three glasses of wine in a row. So the wine and the, and the alcoholic drinks do have calories that we must be aware of. And there's, a very good, uh, there's very good information on the calories in alcohol on the HSC website. So I suppose we need to think that all, there's a lot of different diets out there um, and a lot of them do work in the short term. So we really have to try and find a variety of dietary approaches that can produce weight loss in adults. And this choice should be based on the person's preferences and health status and needs to be discussed with a medical practitioner or dietitian. But really, at the end of the day, long-term term sustainability is what is needed. And that's why the promotion is really there in terms of increasing the amount of fruit, vegetables, and whole grains to increase our dietary fiber intake. The other thing that is really important is the importance of sleep. And again, this can be difficult in the situation that we're living in now. But good sleep patterns are vital as they help to contribute to a healthy circadian rhythm. And circadian rhythm is our 24-hour clock. And if that is disrupted, as happens with shift work, it can negatively affect health. And this is partly mediated through higher body mass index. 
So it is vital that we have a good sleep routine, avoiding daytime naps, trying to avoid caffeine you know, in the evening time, trying to avoid heavy meals or exercise too close to bedtime, and trying to avoid smoking and too much alcohol near bedtime. We all know that if you drink, have a few drinks before you go to bed, you fall asleep more quickly, but you also sleep, the quality of your sleep is, is less good and you usually wake up more earlier. So I'm going to hand back to Katie again to go through some practical rec recommendations around physical activity. So thanks, Claire. So earlier we were talking about the role of physical activity in weight management, but it's also important to recognize all the other benefits that physical activity has. So as well as helping to maintain a healthy weight, it's associated with improved sleep, helping to manage stress and improving quality of life. And the statistics are really impressive. If you look at them here, reducing your chance of type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, reducing chance of falls and depression, chance of joint and back pain, and also certain cancers. So huge benefits to physical activity. And many of these benefits occur independent of weight loss. If we go back to the study we looked at earlier, if you look at that red circle there, that's highlighting the people that were classified as non-responders, and that's because they lost less weight than what was expected during that exercise intervention. Well, you, if you look at the other statistics from those people, their waist circumference was actually lower, their blood pressure improved, their resting heart rate improved, and their fitness improved. So all of these benefits occurred independent of weight loss. And this leads to this conclusion, that exercise should be encouraged and the emphasis on weight loss reduced. So in terms of recommendations for incorporating physical activity for health, this should be individualized and it'll depend on your starting level. So, but general recommendations are to aim for 30 to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity on three to five days per week. So that's something like going for a walk or a run. It could be playing sport like tennis, or if you're like Matt Damon here and have the sea and Dorky in your five kilometers radius, it could be going for a swim. It's important to note for weight loss maintenance that volume of exercise needs to be higher. So current recommendations are for an hour a day, four to five days per week. Independent of that activity, it's also important to break up your sitting time. So this is independently associated with health risk. So if you do find yourself sitting at a screen or just sitting for a long time, try to break it up when you can, even for two to three minutes, going for a short walk up and down stairs, or even just standing up and doing some stretches. And also to try and include some strength and balance activities into your week as well. This can be activities of daily living, like carrying bags, or it could be lifting weights or using resistance bands, for example. But in the whole scheme of things, the most important thing is to find a routine that works for you, something that you enjoy and can incorporate into your lifestyle. One of the biggest challenges for most people is finding something that they can keep up in the long term. And yet this is what's most important for long term health. So finding something that works for you, it could be this home based routine like this man in Cork or exercising with the family. It could be exercising on your own if you want some time on your own or with a friend or partner, or making use of your back garden like Captain Tom Moore. The key message is that all activity is good and that while the more the better, that some is much better than none. So in summary, exercise and healthy diet have many benefits independent of weight and these should be the key focus. The most important thing is finding something that you can keep up in the long term. So find a routine that works for you and that you enjoy. So where can you find accurate nutritional and exercise advice? There are various sites like the HSE and Safe Food, which have extremely helpful information. Also this booklet produced by one of the Ireland East hospitals and other materials from Healthy Ireland that are available online. And we've included links to all of these and others here. And as Claire said, the slides from this webinar and this information will be posted on the UCD Institute of Food and Health website. So with that, we'd just like to say thank you very much for joining us this evening. We hope you got something out of it and we're happy to discuss any questions you might have.
Thank you very much, um, Katie and Claire. Um, that was an excellent presentation and it was really nice to see the combination of the diet and exercise aspects of it. Um, so we're going to now take over um, some questions from the Q&A um, Q aspects. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to um, read them out and then I divert them either to Katie or Claire or to both of them if, if, needs, if needs be. Um, so the first one is, um, is, is a question um, regarding the study where they calculated the weight loss when doing different types of exercises. So is there any reason why there was no weight loss when doing resistance training? Um, I, maybe Kate, you can, you can answer that in general terms rather than being specific for resistance training, but maybe in general terms, why some people might not lose weight. Yeah, so that, that was a review paper of, and I was primarily looking at randomized controlled trials, but one reason it, that could be with resistance training is that you can actually, you can, you're putting on muscle mass. So even though you might not see a change on the scales, you're actually becoming healthier. So there is, there could be improvements in body composition, but it's just on the scales, all you're seeing is changes in weight. So that's a really important point to acknowledge um, with regards to resistance training. The other thing compared to aerobic exercise, generally in a short space of time, you can burn more calories through aerobic exercise. You're raising your heart rate higher than you would for the same duration of time with resistance exercise. So that's, that's one of the rationales behind aerobic exercise for weight loss. But as I said, resistance exercise really is key for um, muscle mass and body composition. Um, maybe one for you, Claire. Um, can postmenopausal women lose weight? Um, Somebody is asking here. Yes, everybody can lose weight, but obviously it's more difficult uh, when you're as you get older because your metabolic rate drops. So it's it makes it even more important that alongside diet that you try and do some exercise. Uh, and, and that exercise, as Katie said, should be something that you can fit into your routine and that preferably would be aerobic in terms of weight loss. But the uh, resistance exercise is also good for menopausal women uh, because it helps um, their muscle mass, but also helps in balance, overall balance, which is important. And we know that bone health is really important in postmenopausal women. So therefore, balance is vital. So maintaining good balance and good muscle mass is, is really important. Um, and Katie, there's a question here on um, HIIT training. So is it as beneficial for weight loss as it's supposed to be? Or as, that, is it, as it's presented as being? There's, there's various um, systematic reviews on it, but as far as I'm aware, it's fairly similar to continuous exercise training that there's no huge extra benefits of um, HIIT training over continuous training for weight loss, but where there are benefits is in terms of cardiorespiratory fitness. So, and the other benefits, huge benefits of HIIT are um, the, that you can achieve these benefits of exercise with a shorter volume shorter time commitment. So for people with very busy lifestyles, HIIT training can be very useful because you get the same benefits in a shorter space of time. But what it really comes down to in terms of weight loss is just the total amount of energy that's expended. And that comes down to the, the overall volume of exercise that's done. And, and this is just one follow up, I guess. Somebody's asking about the risk of over exercise. So how could one gauge how much of a risk of over-exercise balanced against the gains of weight loss, but over-exercise, I think Katie would really want to be exercising a lot, right, in that, in that instance. Yeah, so it is, a, it is an issue certainly for some yeah. people and they're, that if, if people can become addicted to exercise and if you are involved in very large volumes of exercise, there, there can be negative 
health consequences associated with with it. So that is something to to be aware of. But the the general recommendations of the um, at least a minimum of thirty to sixty minutes, three to five days a week. It's you wouldn't be getting into to seeing issues like that there. Um, in the there's a question here from Elizabeth about the um, 12 week study where people were asked to burn 500 uh, calories five days a week. She's just asking how how would one measure that, um, and is it easy or hard to achieve to achieve that? Um, so this one way people might measure it is through heart rate so you might see handles on a treadmill in a gym where you can hold on to them and it, it measures your heart rate and then it'll give you a caloric expenditure based on that but that's an estimate and there are errors associated with it so it's very difficult to get precisely accurate measurements from from methods like that so it's better really not to focus hugely on the caloric expenditure. You can really only determine that accurately in a, in a lab environment. But going for a moderate intensity exercise is, um, is moderate to vigorous is, is useful. And Claire, this one is for you from Angela. Mm -hmm. um, why is the initial weight loss always great? And then it seems to, be, to get very difficult to see any change. Uh, well, it depends on the type of diet. So if you're on a low carbohydrate diet, um, you will, the initial weight loss can be water or fluid because you lose your glycogen stores. So your glycogen stores are your uh, stores of carbohydrate in your liver and muscles. And, and glycogen is stored in our liver and muscles with, with water. So if we lose those or if they reduce, we will lose water. Uh, also, I suppose in a general sense, when people lose weight initially, um, their metabolic rate is, is, is sort of at a normal level. And, and the problem is that your body resists weight loss. Uh, it, it, your body doesn't want to lose weight. So your metabolic rate actually declines a little bit over time. And the longer you're on a weight reducing diet, the more difficult it is then to try and continue to lose weight. And that's really one of the problems with yo-yo dieting also in that people then their metabolic rate is reduced and then when they go to eat again and try and eat food again then their metabolic rate has gone so slow that you know they hold on to all the food very very readily so that's again reiterates the importance of trying to have diet and exercise because if you're doing some exercise that will help to maintain or keep up your metabolic rate um Somebody is just asking here about um, the the role of you know, technology and the Fitbits, for example, that we all that everybody has now. Um, do, do do they play a role in weight loss? The measure of heart rate and calorie consumption, and how accurate are they? I don't know who wants to take to take that. <laughs> Maybe it, it can tie no. in. Claire can join in as um, well. But yes. like, just back to the question that was asked earlier about how you mm. can measure calorie intake. Mm or like your Fitbit will give you, based on your heart rate, a, an estimate of caloric expenditure. Mm -hmm. So if you are interested, that is a, a mm -hmm. way, but it is important to be aware of the, they're, the, they're trying their best, but they're not as good as, as measurements in the laboratory. So it's important to acknowledge that they are an estimate, but mm -hmm. some kind of monitoring step-based goals, they can be very useful in terms mm -hmm. of, of goal setting. Um, yeah. I don't want to comment on yeah. it. No, I, I think they're just good as, as motivation. They help with, with motivation. So if you have decided your goal is to do 10,000 steps every day and you can see that you have or haven't done it, it, it does help motivate you to try and uh, do it. You know? So I think as a, as a motivating factor, they are useful. Um, the absolute accuracy is probably less important than maintaining the regular exercise and trying to have yourself motivated to do that. Yeah, so the, I think they're, they're a fun way, a fun way of sort of being motivated. Um, there's a lot of more questions here, but I'm, I'm conscious of the of them of the time as well. So we are we are tend to 
10, 10 to 8 and I don't want to keep people too much longer so maybe we just do um, one more um, um, I have one, one person here saying that they've, they've um, lost weight um, in the last 10 months um, they seem to have plateaued I think that's mm -hmm. going back to something Claire was talking about er earlier my exercises increase if I've gotten fitter should my calories increase too um, if somebody has lost sufficient weight, so if they've lost 5% or 10%, whatever their goal is, uh, then they can increase their, their, their caloric intake. Because unless you, if you, unless you want to continue losing weight, then you increase your body weight and you increase our, your caloric, caloric intake to maintain your body weight. So the, the, the greatest focus has to be in that case on somebody trying to eat their fruit and veg and try and get into a routine in which they eat foods um, at their meal times, try not to snack between meals and try and enjoy their food. Because what we really must remember is that food and eating is not just about having nutrients. It also is about socialization. It's about enjoyment. It's about celebration and being able to have um, a regular dietary intake that allows you not to overthink about food, but to try and have it incorporated into your diet in a way that is enjoyable and allows you to maintain weight. Um, what, 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 what people really should try and avoid and what the, the, uh, the questionnaire is try to avoid yo-yo dieting. So what you really don't want is that somebody loses weight and then regains it. Uh, but if they can try and maintain the weight and get it a set weight, uh, that is, that's what is, is ideal. Okay, um, thank you very much to both of you. I'm going to hand back quickly to the director of our institute, Professor Dolores O'Riordan, who's going to close this session. Thank you. Thanks to, thanks to all of you for logging into this webinar this evening. And it's great to see so much interest and so many questions that you are asking. But of course, the biggest thanks goes to Claire and Katie this evening for sharing your expertise, both from a diet point of view and nutrition and exercise. And what I suppose is a very emotive topic of weight management. And no doubt all of us are motivated to go towards Google to get information when it comes to weight management. So I hope from the, the talk tonight, both Claire and Katie have impressed upon you that really you have to be careful where you get your source of information from and you really need to have scientific rigor underpinning a lot of the decisions that you make. And as we've already said, there'll be a lot of information up on UCD's Institute of Food and Health website in order to give you proper material to base your decisions upon. So I think even though both speakers explained that it's not always simple and it can be complex in trying to ensure that we're managing our weight carefully and in a healthy way, I was able to pick out, I suppose, the clear practical tips that they gave. The first one I was that stuck with me in this COVID situation where we're seeing a lot of rainbows being used as a symbol of hope. So what stuck to me was eat your rainbow of fruit and veg eat plenty of them, get up to your 800 grams per day. And while you're having them, you're also going to increase your fiber, which we also need to do. Use the palm of your hand as a guide. Don't eat too much fat. Be careful with the amount of alcohol that, that, that you're eating. And that'll really put you on, on a good stead from a diet point of view. And of course, then make sure you get some sleep also. I think then Katie has clearly explained to us that exercise does play a role in weight management, but more importantly, it has a number of health benefits. Choose an exercise that you enjoy, get out for a half an hour to an hour, three to five times a day. And overall, you should be in a pretty good place after that. There were my messages from tonight. The other key things I heard were, enjoy your food and, and find an exercise that, that you enjoy. So thank you to, to Katie and thank you to Claire. Certainly I found it very helpful, very informative. The other bit very relevant to sitting in front of Zoom calls all day is get up and move more regularly. And certainly the Fitbit is good for me to prompt me to, to get up and move. So, so thanks for pointing that out as well. So thank you all for joining in. Um, thanks to the Institute team that organized this evening, Dr. Geraldine Quinn and Professor Lorraine Brennan. Um, and hopefully you log on to our site to, to get some more information. Thanks very much. <laughs>